Wonderful. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this exciting session of our initial teacher education series. Today, we're introducing an Erasmus Plus project as part of our practice session, the EU Goes School, Teachers as EU Ambassadors. We'll explore how this project can benefit from the strength of the e-twinning community and how our unique network might help expand its reach and impact even further. Uh, first, I would like to remind you that you can always find all this information related to our events, our activities in our eTwinning for Future Teachers group, and also the recording of this session, as well as the presentation will be found there after the event. So, uh, we are glad to have with us two remarkable speakers today who bring a wealth of experience and expertise to this session. Niels Bresner and Fabian Heint have been involved with the project's predecessor, EU Go School, uh, right from its, in its inception. Both have dedicated their efforts to developing targeted didactic content tailored for e-learning and have been actively involved in the design and implementation of cooperation seminars and teacher training programs. With their extensive backgrounds in academic research and teaching, Niels and Fabian bring both practical insights and innovative ideas to this project. But before giving the floor to our speakers, I would like to hand it over for a while to Carl and Vivian. Thank you very much, Carl and Vivian. I know you have prepared some words uh, for us before we officially uh, start the presentation. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Marta. Yeah, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Nice and Fabian, they are already introduced, so I just had to introduce myself and my colleague Vivian. <laughs> my name is Karl Chida. I'm a Deputy Managing Director of uh, the Teacher Training Center at the uh, University in Munich, the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich. And um, my colleague Vivian Schröder, I'm sure she will say uh, as well a few sentences to herself. Um, we are very happy today that we have the opportunity to present our project in this setting today. Um, yeah, thanks again, Marta, to, to, that you could make this happen. And thank you for your interest. Um, EU goes school, teaches SEU ambassadors. This project is funded by Erasmus Plus, uh, Jean Monnet teacher training. For three years, um, we have already reached the end of the term. Um, but we are very happy because again, successfully we participated in a call and uh, this year and uh, we got it again and we can now continue for three more years with the project. Um, we, our group at the Munich Center for Teacher Education, we are an institution of the University of Munich. And um, let's say it's simple, we take care of our student teachers. Uh, we offer them counseling and coachings, and we offer them additional programs beyond the curriculum something like uh, workshops, um, which connect the theory to practical issues. <clears throat> and we support our faculties um, by yeah, taking care about the study programs, um, mostly in quality management. In this project, we cooperate with the teaching unit for didactics of politics and society of the Geschwister Scholl Institute for Political Science of our university. So now my colleagues, uh, Fabian and uh, Niels, they will give you all details about the project. But before Vivian also will say a few sentences. Thank you. 
Yes, I would like to give you a really short overview of the project before my colleagues Niels and Fabian go into more detail. So overall, the project Yugo School aims to encourage student teachers and in-service teachers to reflect on their own attitudes towards Europe. For this, and through the measures of the project, we support them in building up conceptual knowledge about the European Union and its functioning, and also to enable them to develop and enhance teaching skills so that they can create learning opportunities for pupils to learn about, for, and through Europe. So the goal is to help develop a European identity among teachers and their students as well. These project objectives are to be or were already achieved through um, three measures. First, we designed a Europe e-learning course. Secondly, a university seminar took place. You will learn more about these two measures in a moment. I would now like to take a closer look at the third measure, the multiplier program. The aim here is to reach as many teachers, teacher trainers, and interested parties as possible and present the results of the project so that they can, again, um, improve their EU competence, furthermore, pass it on to their students and overall benefit from the project outcomes. So that's why we are here today. That being said, I would now like to hand over to my colleagues, Niels and Fabian, who will present the project, its relevance, and the project results to you in more detail. Hello, welcome. So great to see so many people that logged on. We're going to take a little deep dive into our project. So let me see if I'm able to share this with you. Um, there we go. So, yeah, that worked. The presentation is out there. So. Uh, we would like to take a little bit of a deep dive and also in the academics and the background of this project. Me and my colleague Fabian, we work together at uh, LMU Munich University together and we teach, we do research and we want to figure out how you can improve teacher training in, in a European method or way um, very unique to our project. So Fabian, you also want to maybe say hi. Definitely. Can everyone hear me? We had some issues earlier since we were in the same room, but I think now it should work out, hopefully. Um, also, hi from my side. My name is Fabian, and as Niels just mentioned, I'm a researcher, doctoral student currently, and a lecturer at LMU Munich, specifically involved in the field of um, teacher education um, for social sciences and civic education. And we've both been collaborating for the past almost three years, I think, and today we'll simply guide you through, I think, the most necessary parts of our project. And I think, Niels, you're going to start, if I'm right. Yes, thank you, Fabian. So EU education as relevant as ever. So there have been some changes since the European election, and we have different countries, in, uh, including Belgium, Germany, Malta and Austria that now have voting age set down to 16 voting age in Greece being 17. So this makes it very clear how European education will have to be put forward as one of the main targets for schools, educators, teachers, and universities, of course. Uh, the European Parliament uh, Youth Survey found out that many youths get a lot of their information from social media being 41% and other being news outlets. There again, we have to bear in mind how important the the place of school and schooling is for young individuals to gain knowledge about not just the European Union, but how to become a citizen in, in society today and how to use their different options on how to learn uh, on different parts. And um, it is more important than ever because when we look at what, for example, the Minister of Education from Spain was telling how citizenship education and democracy education has just become increasingly important in these times in all of Europe. So education together with other factors such as shared cultures, shared identities and shared views 
make up a big part of European identity today. And when viewing a European identity, it can be viewed from various different standpoints. And within the academic literature, there is a lot of dispute on how it should be seen. But we take an aspect uh, looking at it basically through teacher education. And um, teacher education will has to be seen as a whole. So not just through citizenship education, but also through different various ways of how it can be interpreted. So we have a, a scholar, um, her name is um, Ms. Obele, who is one of the leading political educators within the series of political education. And here we have a little quote that I would like to bring. Teachers report particular difficulties when it comes to education on the EU. As one major obstacle, many point out the great complexity of the European multi-level system. In addition to the highly dynamic nature of European integration, which leads to frequent changes in names, members, procedures, and competencies. Due to the integration process, EU knowledge generally has a short half-life. As a consequent, consequence, uh, continuous and proactive training of teachers is indispensable of course. So this is a nice quote that we translated ourselves because it was originally written in German, but we just liked to basically show this and bring this forward. We also have a, a second quote that we brought along. Uh, in line with expectations, secondary school teachers tend to have more extensive EU-related knowledge than teachers of other school types, which of course is a shame. Male teachers show greater knowledge than their female colleagues. Older teachers tend to be more interested in the EU generally, have a slightly more positive attitude towards it than their younger colleagues. Otherwise, they seem not to be direct influences of the measured background variables on EU-related attitudes. However, there are important effects of teachers' existing EU knowledge. Those who know more about the EU have more positive attitude towards the integration process and also tend to have a slightly more positive general performance related EU attitude. So that is something that has been measured through different factors as, for example, the EU barometer, which every year takes uh, interesting questions related to the EU and other factors. And this is always every year something very interesting to look inside and see how uh, different measures and performances have changed over time. As for EU um, identity, that is also partly measured in this, in this survey, you can see a generally rising positive trend. Of course, this doesn't account for all the 27 EU member states. It's individually different. However, the overall trend has been positive. So this is a little bit of the academic background on, on how we approach this topic and, and what what we think is important. And we have developed some different tools that we would like to use to basically enhance um, professional competence on EU-related topics for teachers. So Fabian, you can take it away for the XR hubs. Absolutely, thank you. And maybe if you just like move on to the next slide exactly. Um, I'm going to tell you a bit more about XR Hubs, which is one uh, tool which we used as part of this project. There's a slight catch to it, uh, not all too bad, but um, we're going to tell you about that just a few slides um, after this one. First of all, I want to let you know what XR Hubs are. Um, at our institute, we have a very long history in using digital tools um, to facilitate teaching processes. And as Niels just mentioned, and I hope it's also something that many of you can relate to is that EU traditional, like first of all, of course, we have an issue with teachers managing to teach the EU in general, but second of all, the way we teach about the EU still in many EU member states is problematic. It's problematic for the very reason that most EU learning is basically trying to remember the contract, it's trying to remember the history of the EU, and that might be perfectly fine, but it has a very, very short half-life, as Niels just mentioned, and generally isn't very effective in motivating young people in developing a positive attitude towards the EU or even caring much about learning more about it. That's why we used a new media format, which is called XR Hubs. XR, just to give you some basic knowledge, refers to cross-reality. It's just a shortcut and in general includes all emerging or modern digital technologies, 
which could be virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, virtual worlds. So you might also understand computer games that to be part of XR hubs in some regards. And they commonly involve 3D models or simulations across a physical, virtual, and immersive platform. So basically, XR hubs or platforms, XR world spaces, it's, those are all interchangeable terms to describe an approach in which you embed educational content in a 3D environment so students can navigate it, access it, and it also offers the possibility for students to interact with each other, usually through the way of avatars. If you could move on to the next slide. Um, so what could they be good for? I mean, I'm sure many of you are teachers, so you're used to using school books, you're used to using other forms of printed media, also sometimes digital media, but it all happens in the, in the two days, 2D space. So new potential use cases for which we can use XR hubs are, for example, virtual exhibitions, simulations, therapy settings, meetings, online classrooms, and I'm sure you can understand that COVID-19 really demonstrated this importance of creating new environments which can happen online and are not necessarily tied to um, the necessity of being present um, in a real life classroom. And one of the main perks which we have with XR hubs is that we can visualize abstract information. So as I just mentioned, learning about different contracts, all the technicalities, all the formalities, bullet points of EU history is very abstract. So now we basically have the opportunity to visualize this information in a way that's more accessible to students, also to teachers. And in general, this kind of immersion and also the potential link to media consumption that our students already have. Um, I'm sure you know it's not uh, news that young people generally nowadays speaking vastly consume digital digital media such as video games. So that means that XR hubs a, are a format which directly link to their everyday experience in media consumption. And since we still lack data on the effectiveness in um, fields like civic education or social science education, we have very good experiences and evidence, especially from STEM related disciplines. So this could be a very promising indicator for the purpose of using XR hubs in the future. And another big advantage is that we can include the students in content creation also in the development. Since it's an interactive platform, people can interact with each other. This also enables us to proactively involve students in participating in interacting with each other and then also taking part in how this platform develops. And last but not least, the nice thing is you can also use it through VR if you have the technology. What are the drawbacks? I mean, this all sounds very promising. I just told you there is um, a catch or there are multiple catches to it. They are ready to use tools. So we are not programmers. We are not from the information or computer sciences. So we lack the necessary programming skills to do this from scratch, which, which, which would also be very expensive. So we do have ready to use tools where you don't have to be a computer scientist to set up a platform like that but the development and the maintenance remain difficult. We experienced this firsthand. How did we do that? Like we spent two or three years developing a platform. And what basically happened from one day to the other is that suddenly the developers of this platform announced that they're gonna end the service. So that has been a huge issue for us ever since. Luckily, um, with the help of the EU, since we acquired further funding, the next few months, we're gonna work on bringing the platform back online, hopefully better than it was before. Just to let you know, even though even you um, or everyone, including teachers, educators, could set up um, an XR hub, you have to be aware that especially that the ready-to-made tools, you are dependent on external developers, and it could happen that the development or the maintenance runs into some issues, and basically um, there's nothing you can do about it. Um, also, at the same time, since even though a lot of these tools are really easy to use, the development, basically you can say the easier it is to develop, the harder it is also to basically um, create exactly what you want to create. It comes with limitations. If you have, if you try to make something easy, of course you can offer any possibility imaginable. So that's just something to be aware of. And it's also important to know that of course, the while young people are usually very open towards new technologies, the acceptance and also the distribution of the technology which you need to use this is sometimes still limited. So we all have computers and smartphones by now. So in most cases, it won't be very difficult to access it 
using those devices. But if you want to use it, for example, using VR, it might be more difficult since most schools simply don't have VR equipment or have to rely on external um, services um, to use it. And also, of course, at the same time, even today, I hope our students still know how to navigate a book, but it it's simply harder in the case of XR hubs. A lot of users tend to need guidance in the beginning in order to orientate themselves in getting to know how to use these tools. So those are the drawbacks, but I think it also it's a very promising tool. And we're gonna mention some more about the e-learning which or the XR hub which we developed in just a few slides. Yeah, so thank you, Fabian. Let's uh, after a nice little introduction to XR hubs, how they can be used, their drawbacks. Let's dive into our specific project again. So the project that we were developing, it was always important to us to have a certain academic foundation that we were working on. So uh, we're working currently on, on, a, on a model. This is uh, sadly only written in German, but I will give some good translation for, for the things that are highlighted here. Working on a European professional teacher competence so basically the professional competence a teacher would have to know or would have to learn or would have to or already knows or already has acquired or would like to maybe update in some sense on how to basically uh, teach um, European related topics in in a, in a nice way so it's it's divided up in in the most important parts that how this can correlate again with opinions on European integration processes, which are also wide, widely different between different uh, people in different countries and, and different um, backgrounds that we all together have. So it's all about that you would know, would have to know about the literature, the law, the knowledge, which is highly important. So the facts and figures, but this is more the classical of schooling that you had back in the day when you had to teach European institutions, you'd go through the institutions, you want the people to learn the things by heart. And today we know that we have to move away from this way of thinking when learning topics related to EU. So it's also about the didactical knowledge and it's also about the epistemological knowledge. So the way of thinking, how do we think that these things come together under which lens and under which understanding and other factors that we're also interested because we always after we do uh, seminars or after we interact with um, teachers that, that we are teaching or training, we also want to ask them and survey them. So we also ask them for political interest or interest in politics generally and their teacher beliefs. So what they think or deem important in the way that they teach in, in different uh, scenarios and questions that we test. Um, the the first component of our project, which is the e-learning, this is together with the XR Hub, something that we bring forward different mediums that you can learn about the EU. So you have podcasts, you have expert interviews, we have different uh, screencasts that we took. And this is basically supposed to end up being a very nice interactive e-learning where you're able to move around and learn as much uh, about the EU as you would like to know to uh, any certain extent or to any level from beginner to professional. So at this stage, we've completed all the, on, all the concept that we wanted around this, the summary of the literature. So it's a very comprehensive academic piece of work bringing together all the fundamental thoughts and reasonings that we have in current academics regarding EU related topics. And we wanted to all put this together in an open source platform. So it was highly important for us that this was an easy to access platform to use, ready to use for everyone. So we're aiming that um, this should be available on all forms of platforms. So basically you can use it on your laptop, on a tablet, that you can use it in a VR format as well as, as giving you a more immersive kind of look into the experience, which we deem of, of more interest and more fun to maybe use in, in certain schooling contexts. And it's supposed to also be updated for, for the future. It's also going to be in, in German and in English, and we're hoping to even expand into further other languages if possible. Uh, an open source um, platform was so important to us that everyone would have the ability to you know go to the website download the, the system and just enjoy. Um, 
So we can maybe even later on show a little overview or a video of how this is going to look in the future. Uh, but now we've basically decided that after we had um, a little bit of a turndown because we had it all set up in Mozilla Hubs, which was the platform that my colleague Fabian was mentioning earlier. And this sadly got shut down. So now we have a basically new idea of how to pull it up. And that's something Fabian would also like to tell you about. Yeah, so essentially, um, we're later probably going to try to at least show you some impressions on how the learning platform looked like before the um, platform got shut down. Um, but it will likely still look like in the future, but hopefully in a better version. Um, so if a project teaches you anything from like setbacks like that is that basically there's always room for improvement. And one of the reasons um, or one of the things we decided to do for the future is to use a game engine. Why use a game engine? Simply for the fact which I just mentioned, if you use a ready to make tool such as Mozilla Hubs, um, you are very limited in your options. You can place images, you can place 3D objects, you have limited interaction possibilities, but they are at least in my personal opinion, not comparable to let's say a modern day video game. So this is why we decided to develop or set up the platform um, the updated platform in a new engine, specifically a game engine, which um, also improves the learning efficiency and the user experience. So the more a platform like that essentially resembles the user experience which students have in their everyday uh, media consumption, likelihood that they will also have an improved experience and overall effective learning process um, increases with that. The second advantage is the offline access. So with the most of the ready to make tools, you're relying on a browser um, application. So in this case, it's simply a program which you download and install, and this enables you to access the content without, for example, having to rely on a constant internet connection, which I know for some European countries isn't as much of an issue in Germany and some especially rural areas, it definitely is. And it also allows for cross platform flexibility. So you can optimize the content for the various devices which you have, which might be in some schools or in the case of some students or teachers tablets, but you can also optimize this for smartphones or even VR headsets that I mentioned before. And of course, in the end, you have improved visuals and performance. So the graphics will simply be better. The animations will be smoother. And this will especially be beneficial for older or lower power devices. So we don't have to um, rely on hoping that every school, every student, every teacher has extremely modern and high performing devices. OK, great. Thank you, Fabian, for that. So after basically having explained the first part of our project, which is the e-learning environment, we also wanted to do this real life with students and uh, teachers and students that are in their final phase of their studies. So we also conducted a seminar where we had different um, topics reaching from all over the topics from EU history to other uh, interesting topics re resulting in in all the things you basically would have to know to get a complete overview, a holistic view of how the EU functions and also didactical tricks on how you can teach this to your students and to your later uh, pupils in schools, which was highly important to us. We, we had a nice little combination that we even had the opportunity on going on an excursion to Strasbourg, looking at uh, diff different views of how you can make historical learnings on on different cases by visiting places. We had the opportunity of visiting the EU Parliament, and we would love to keep going with uh, these in-person seminars, which are relatively nicely sized groups between 30 and 40 students that we're able to, to take on an excursion and, and do a full-fledged full seminar with them as well which we, of course, um, analyze with surveys and see if there is any improvement from, from, from the seminar that we have given and basically having a steadily evolving better seminar for each semester. That would be pretty much the second part of our project. And of course, it is nice. We also have used the e-learning in the seminar context so that we're basically combining both of the factors together. and. 
one of the reasons we're doing these talks today is basically about dissemination. So we really want to, to get to people to know about our project and to hear about it and to disseminate further. So we, we're looking at the open source platform, which is the most readily access platform once this will be done to access for free for, for anyone who has interest for this in both uh, English language so that there should be the availability for everyone. We also have a multiplier system that we already mentioned, but that's something I'm not going to talk about right now. And then, of course, the teacher training that we do here in Munich, which, you know, would be more or less accessible to 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 some than others. And therefore, we have the expected results to increase the competencies among students, trainee teachers and teachers. Valuable input through reflection. That's what I constantly really want to put emphasis on as we really want to have, you know, a, a measurable growth in, in competence in these kind of factors and increased integration of digital media formats in EU education, which is also very important to us. So this is pretty much everything on the presentation and we would like to go over in a little discussion phase now, answer any possible questions or also hear about um, how especially, you know, the e-twinning project as also being an Erasmus Plus project could give nice synergies with, with our Jean Monnet project that we have here together. And we're excited to hear your questions. We also have a little bit more input from Carl and Vivian, I believe. And then let's see that we can also at the end get a nice little view of how the e-learning platform was looking uh, originally. Thank you, Wonderful. Mia. Thank you, Fabian. Yeah. Sorry. And, and yeah, sorry, Vivian, I propose that you go ahead while we are waiting for the question, because I just asked the people to input their comments or their questions in the chat. So let's give them a couple of minutes maybe to reflect on, on what they want to ask. And yeah, you, meanwhile, you can go ahead, of course. Thank you. And thank you all for your interest in being here um, regarding our cooperation with eTwinning. We would like to continue to offer further training and workshops in order to publicize our project and make it known Europe-wide. As we are still at the beginning of our collaboration, we hope um, for a profitable exchange with other e twinning projects and hope you can help us with that. And with this in mind, I would also like to open the conversation. First of all, we are of course happy to answer any questions you may have, but also welcome ideas or interest in a collaboration and exchange. Great. I don't know if our audience is quite shy today or if they simply don't read the chat, but uh, I'll repeat one more time. If you have any questions or comments, uh, you are kindly invited to post in the chat because unfortunately we cannot give you the rights to open your microphone and your camera, but you are very, very welcome uh to to post whatever you want in in the chat and i'll be reading uh it for you uh and yeah so maybe you you still need some more time but i'm sure i mean we have uh over 70 people joining this event so it's really fantastic if you could bring a bit more of interaction i know that you are sometimes quite shy but i think also this is the perfect opportunity also because uh, I believe there are many twinners among our attendees and you received a, a call, a sort of call from our guest speaker to uh, help them uh, understand how e twinning can uh, contribute and help in this, the dissemination of this project and yes, expand the reach of this project. So uh, please feel free to give any advice. Uh, if you are an expert and if you already run some projects within twinning and you are familiar with the dissemination, I'm sure any any advice would, would be appreciated on, on our speaker side. So, OK, I don't know, Carl, if you wanted to add something. Yeah, maybe. Um, yeah, thank you, Martha. Thank you, Vivian. Um, yeah, as my as my colleague said, um, we are quite new in working with eTwinning. We have a nice project uh, that you, you heard about, and we would like to disseminate it within Germany, within Europe, and probably in two different uh, ways. One way could be 
um, to work with uh, other universities, to work with uh, student teachers, and probably to create more teaching units on uh, EU issues. <clears throat> that could be one uh, opportunity. Um, the other opportunity could be to work with schools and uh, teachers to uh, give teachers further training, to help them to work, to teach EU uh, issues in, in their classes. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe do this two different ways. Yeah, and also Anne is saying uh, to check with your NSOs whether your country is sending teacher educators and student teacher to our on-site networking seminar in Nuremberg this May 2025. The expert here today will be also there. Uh, I mean, Anne is uh, then part of the national support organization uh, of Germany. So I think and maybe I can give you the floor and uh, you can uh, explain a bit better what are you going to to do there. Uh, just give me one second. OK, now you should be able to open the microphone and the camera. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Um. Um, it's lovely to be here and um, we are so happy that um, uh, this team of uh, researchers and teacher trainers and um, also part of the uh, gremium of the University of Teacher Training in München are here to um, to uh, showcase the work that they are um, been um, investing a lot of time on for the past over the past three years. Um, I really would like to warmly welcome um, teacher trainers um, to check in with their um, national support organizations if they have filled in this so called shared calendar to share um, to send teacher educators and student teachers to our um, on site event. Uh, there will be, I think, a total of 13 countries attending. Um, these are always limited, so we have 60 participants, but certainly one of you is um, on the list and you will have the opportunity not only to meet um, some of these experts here today um, in person and network with them, um, as well as your students being able to connect with one another within an international context, which is very valuable um, opportunity that um, are growing so more and more of the national support organizations are offering on-site events which are very valuable um, opportunity to uh, connect with one another so i encourage you to check in with your nso and if you are interested to already let them know that you would like to be in their delegation um, to attend this event in the beautiful city of nuremberg uh, which is in bavaria um, and uh, taking place this um, may 2025. It's a three day event. Um, that's what I would encourage all of you. And those of you who are not, I saw in the chat um, up to, to date with what eTwinning is, definitely um, go to your national support and, uh, organization to find out more about that. Um, ideally, you have an idea before you attend these um, best practice events, but if that's not the case, this might have wakened your interest to find out more and um, definitely contact them and you have in your local language um, the, all the information you need to find out about e-twinning and e-twinning for future teachers which is especially designed for um, teachers and training thank you thank you very much and for for your contribution and yeah indeed uh, there are quite many people that are asking in the chat if the presentation will be available and i uh, if you agree of course i will uh, made the presentation available for all the participants in our e twinning for Feature Teachers group. And one more practical information that no certificates are issued for uh, for this specific event. So we will not be sending any certificates uh, uh, of attendance. Um, OK, I don't know if you would like to maybe move on. Uh, Nils, I, I, you have, have something else to present or, or not. Maybe you would like to add something. Yes, so Actually, I think Fabian yeah. can take this away. We, yeah. we we have a little look at the the e-learning platform, how it originally looked, and Wonderful. it's going to look a lot better soon. <laughs> Wonderful. Let's see. Please let me know if you can't hear or see anything. 
Yes, we can see everything perfectly. Uh, uh, just one thing, Fabian. I don't know if there is music that we are supposed to. to I activated to. it. It it should work. Like currently not, but I think it should no. work. As, uh... Because we cannot hear. Just for you to know. Mm -hmm. No, that's correct. Okay, perfect. <laughs> So yeah, basically going through through this hallway is where you can see this was the 3D environment that we had. This is one of the examples that looks at European institutions among um, the most important ones and different timelines. So this is how you can see it was it was built together with graphics, texts, videos, and some interactive elements. So this is basically supposed to to give you a certain overview of having the feeling of of walking yourself uh, the aisles of um, a museum, giving you the most important facts and figures that you need to know. I don't know, the picture is a little unclear now, but that's maybe due to the internet. So you can just basically check out everything that you're interested in. You have a main hub where you basically get in and you decide in which level you want to start out, which which topic you uh, want to learn Welcome everyone about. to this EPRS online event, which you is basically, organized by the European Parliament History service which was established okay, i'm just going to stop it here for now yeah so then you open videos you open links you open interactive questionnaires where you can basically see all the things that we have in this e-learning uh, platform put together so if we just skip that video which was a very long video it basically brings you back into uh into the learning environment for this chapter being the European Parliament. Um, what is also interesting um, is that we're going to have a website where everything is going to be online. So I would also be excited to hear from Carl and Vivian about the availability on everything relating here, because we'll post videos, we'll post content. We'll, as soon as the new platform is online and available for everyone to access, we'll out. make sure, sure that uh, everyone has access to the e-learning platform and can feel free to use it and also obviously get in contact with us for feedback reasons or for reasons of collaboration for interests because we're highly interested on on international collaboration in europe throughout to see how this learning environment uh, evolves and how it can be used in different classrooms or university settings or school settings of course yeah also just want to add so this was an impression and um, we basically recorded the work that we had at the point when the platform was shut down. So just to avoid any confusion, as I mentioned, it's not currently available for use, but as Niels just mentioned, please feel free to follow our um, website, which is currently being uh, set up, but in a few couple, in a few weeks or in a few months, if you simply Google EU Go School, or if you simply look for one of our names, you will likely have no trouble finding the website where we will always post updates on the current work in progress. So good chances are that, um, in half a year or a year from now, you'll be able to use this learning platform as part of your schoolwork or to simply also train yourself or update your own knowledge about the EU. And also I want to mention, since we're talking about e-twinning today, so of course there is the question, why are we talking about um, a Jean Monnet project if this is about e-twinning? Vivian already mentioned the multiplier pro um, network, which we're currently in the process of setting up. So if you are interested in basically becoming an expert in teaching about the EU, please visit the website because I'm also sure that a network like this cannot only function in talking about the EU and developing your own skills, but who knows, maybe it's also a network where you can find suitable partners, teachers from other schools, other countries to set up an e-twinning project. So this could also function as a network for future e-twinning projects for you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to all of you for the for this great presentation and very interesting. And uh, there is maybe one question from from my side. From my side, if you could tell us more uh, a bit more about the uh, collaboration and the work with the student teachers, uh, because in in our events, of course, uh, we have the majority of uh, teacher educators. But then, hopefully, we hope that they. Uh, pass their knowledge and the information also to the student teachers. So it would be also interesting to know a bit more from your perspective and how you work with them and how do they feel uh, if this really changes their also um, learning process and so on. 
Yeah, I mean, or Niels, did you want to say something about go ahead. it? Okay, I'll, I'll just go ahead. So first of all, maybe I'll share one or two like facts about uh, how we like basically educate and train teachers in Germany since it's a bit more complicated than in other countries. So essentially, you can't just go ahead and study, let's say, history in university and then move on to become a teacher. I mean, in some rare cases, it's possible, but essentially what you do is from semester one, you study to become a teacher, let's say, for the subject of history. Usually you have a second or a third one. And we have a very pluralistic schooling system. So that means there's elementary school, there's different kinds of secondary schools, basically a very, very complicated system. Now, one of the main, or let's say main distinction is the theoretical studying phase that you have, which might be anywhere from four to five, six years. And then you move on to your practical phase. So it's very similar to basically how we train doctors. You learn a lot about theoretical knowledge, a lot about your own subjects, about theoretical assumptions, how, you should, how you're how supposed theoretically supposed to teach your subject. And then you move on to a practical phase. So this means from being a full-time student, you become a full-time teacher trainee. So you go to school, you have a teacher that supervises you, and this creates a huge divide. We always call it the theory practice gap. So a lot of the students are very like disillusioned. They basically go to school and they're like, nothing I learned from the past five years matters now. I don't understand. This is so different from what I expected. So this makes it very difficult because on the one hand we rely a lot on like theoretical scientific knowledge and the actual teaching relies a lot on practical experience and that's why we chose to involve teacher trainees to somewhat bridge that gap so to have current students that still have no teaching experience so they can benefit from that practical knowledge but to at the same time have teacher trainees that can actually try to reflect their own experiences that they only already made with teaching and try to link it to the theoretical knowledge, which in my opinion, isn't always completely detached from reality. It just looks somewhat different when you're actually in the process of teaching, when you're actually in the classroom. So the experience that we made is that in the beginning, most of the teacher trainees, so most of them were quite young. They were in the first and their second year of their practical phase. And they were in that very, very rebellious mindset of basically saying like, um, I don't really identify with this university setting. It's so different. I learned so much more in my first year of actually practically working with kids. So there was this sort of rebellious attitude. But actually, after a while, when we confronted them with all these new tools, we went on a trip to Stras Strasbourg together to visit um, the EU Parliament. To um, We also visited, for example, the European School in Strasbourg. Um, it was slightly beginning to warm up. And I feel like in the end, a lot of the teacher trainees also really understood as to why they're doing this because, I mean, they had to do it. They were forced to attend a seminar. And from our personal experience, it takes a while to really warm up and to make them understand as to why it makes sense to return to university and again, dive into very theoretical knowledge. But in the end, most of the ones that went out of the seminar um, really said that this again helped them to really reflect on their role and their attitude as teachers um, and that even though they it's very challenging for them to manage a classroom in their first or second year of being teachers or at least teacher trainees and then having to learn again like theoretical university stuff that it actually like really improved their own attitudes to also help them understand different and more novel ways about teaching about EU even in elementary schools. So our personal experience was that it was very, very in a way fruitful to have this exchange, which usually never exists. So it's all about going to university, then being a teacher, and you never have any interaction between these two phases. So in our ex in our like personal opinion, it was really like a fruitful experience and definitely something that we're planning to repeat with um the 2.0, like basically the extension of the project that we got. What I would like to add to this, this is something we observed and also measured. So we, we, we had surveys asking, so basically the question of, is EU as a topic boring or inaccessible or hard to teach or something that I would maybe be afraid to, to start teaching in my classroom? And we could see that after students, teacher, trainee students had visited our seminar and used uh, the different tools, within um, our, our framework that they were feeling more capable of of basically giving away this knowledge further to others. Thank you.
Thank you, Fabian. Thank you, Nils. And uh, we have a question in the chat. How can I become an EU ambassador? Do I have to be a teacher or can I do this as a student? So I believe you are a student teacher, right? I mean, um, so just to clarify the term EU ambassador, I mean, of course, you won't be an actual ambassador for the EU. It's more like to promote knowledge on the EU and promote education on the European Union. If you personally feel like you have any affiliation with education or, I mean, maybe you're also involved in other educational projects or you could personally benefit from this, um, just write us an email and I'm sure we can uh, figure this out or see if um, it makes sense for you, if it makes sense for us um, in general. All of you are welcome to just simply send us an email if you have any questions, if you're interested in the network, if um, you're interested in any of the resources. Wonderful, thank you very much. Uh, OK, I don't see any other questions for the time being in the chat. And as we are approaching uh, the end of our event today, I would like to thank you all of you for for the presentation and i would invite also to continue the discussion uh, and not close it here in this event as our speakers just said feel free to contact them if you have any other questions i know that sometimes here in this event we are quite shy but i'm quite sure that there is a uh, room for discussion that can go beyond can go beyond the this event um okay so i wouldn't close this event without giving you the chance to uh say something to <laughs> wrap up and to to close the officially this event i i really would like you to be the uh, last one who who speaks so please uh, i think we can do a quick round uh carl vivian nils and and fabian for for closing this thank you Yeah, just let me thank you for your interest. Uh, join that uh, session with us and um, yeah, have a look at our um, at our project. And hopefully, in the future, we can work with one or the other together. Wonderful. And also, sorry, just one second to interrupt you because I think uh, as I wrote for before in the chat. Uh, this project is really relevant uh, in this specific moment for, for our community, for eTwinning, because our annual theme for the year 2024-2025 is um, citizenship education and, and EU values. So the community this year will uh, address uh, this very specific theme uh, with activities, events, projects, so it, it's very it's really very good that your presentation uh, was shared uh, at this time. Yeah, just saying that because someone remarked this in the chat. Yeah, Vivian. Oh, I want to say thank you as well. Um, have a nice evening. Thank you for your interest and for being here. Thank you. And Nils. Yeah, thank you so much for tonight. Uh, it's just the one last thought I would like to give to everyone is to always bear in mind, just if you want to teach something EU related, it's not just about the knowledge, knowing the facts, knowing the figures, but it's really more about the methods and the new innovative methods that we can use in teaching today. And I would just like to bring that forth again. And if there's any questions, feel free to either send me or, or Fabian an email. And yeah, thank you for today. Thank you. And yeah, last but not least, Fabian. Well, also, thank you very much for me um, for listening to this presentation. And I just like to say, even though I mean, I'm not officially affiliated with the European Union apart from this project. Um, I know that being a teacher is a very busy job. And personally, I, I can imagine how it would seem like a huge task to, for example, create an e-twinning project on top of all the work which you already have. But I think in the long run, it can really, really benefit your overall job and your satisfaction. And it's amazing that we're privileged enough to have funds like these accessible. And even though our educational systems might be still very different from each other, I think that schools and also our students can greatly benefit from this exchange. So make use of these funds. Um, don't think 
about if you think like your school is good enough, your idea is good enough or not, just give it a shot. And that's my recommendation. Thank you. Thank you very much once again for accepting our invitation and, and presenting your, your project with our community. Thank you very much also to all the attendees. Uh, there were quite many people today uh, and I'm very, very happy. And I hope to continue our collaboration uh, further. So let's let's keep in touch. And I would like to remind uh, one more time to all the participants that recording and flights will be available for you uh, as of uh, next week. Thank you very much again. I wish you all a good evening and stay safe. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 bye.